I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's July 18th, and we have a lot to talk about. Some might say that simply trying to make your way through the world in 2023 can be stressful enough. I'd suggest that living with MS has the potential of adding additional stress and creating additional anxiety in your life. Living your best life with MS makes learning how to successfully manage stress and anxiety a requirement. Joining me to talk about how to manage the stress and anxiety that may be part of your life is Dr. Bree Wanamaker. Dr. Wanamaker lives with MS, and she's a licensed professional counselor and chief therapist and consultant in her practice, Just Us Counseling and Consulting, LLC, in South Carolina. But before we get to my conversation with Dr. Wanamaker, there are a few other things that you should know about. Evidence shows that disease-modifying therapy slows the rate of disability progression in people living with MS. It's why you want to be on a DMT, to preserve the highest possible quality of life for the longest possible length of time. Some disease-modifying therapies are highly effective at slowing progression, but they often cost more and carry a higher risk of side effects. Other disease-modifying therapies are not as effective at slowing progression, but they have far fewer side effects. So there are two different approaches, two different schools of thought when it comes to prescribing MS disease-modifying therapy. The more common approach is to start off with a lower-efficacy disease-modifying therapy and only escalate to a more effective therapy when there's a breakthrough in disease activity. The other approach to prescribing disease-modifying therapy is to start with one of the high-efficacy DMTs, and newly published results from a population-based study indicate that people living with relapsing-remitting MS experience better outcomes if they start on a high-efficacy disease-modifying therapy. A research team in the Czech Republic analyzed data from more than 6,000 patients with relapsing-remitting MS in the national MS registries in the Czech Republic and in Sweden. And all of these patients had been started on a disease-modifying therapy between 2013 and 2016. Just over 95% of the patients in the Czech registry had been started on a low-efficacy DMT but about 40% of the patients in the Swedish registry had been started on a moderate to high efficacy DMT. Now, before we dive into the results of this study, we should review which DMTs the research team considered high efficacy and which DMTs the team considered lower efficacy. Lower efficacy DMTs included Tecfidera, Copaxon, Obagio, and the Interferons. Moderate and high-efficacy DMTs included Ocrevus, Tysabri, Lemtrada, Gelenia, Ponvery, and Rituximab, which is used off-label in MS. After analyzing more than six and a half years of follow-up data for the group of patients from the Czech Republic who had received lower-efficacy DMTs for their initial therapy, and the group of patients from Sweden who had received moderate to high-efficacy DMTs for their initial therapy, the research team found no differences in the time to confirmed disability worsening, which was defined as an increase in EDSS score. As a quick refresher, EDSS is an acronym for Expanded Disability Status Score, It's a method that neurologists use to quantify disability in MS. EDSS is used in assessing someone with MS. It's used to monitor changes in disability over time, and it's widely used in clinical trials. EDSS uses a scoring system of between 0 and 10 to characterize the level of disability in someone who's living with MS. And while the research team found no differences in the time to confirm disability worsening, 
They found that the risk of progressing to an EDSS score of four or higher, and that represents considerable disability, well, that risk was 26% lower among the group of Swedish patients compared to the Czech patients. Additionally, they found the risk of experiencing an MS relapse was reduced by 66% among the Swedish patients, and they found that the likelihood of confirmed disability improvement was three times higher among the Swedish patients. The research team concluded that those patients from Sweden who had been started on a moderate to high-efficacy disease-modifying therapy experienced a better outcome compared to the patients from the Czech Republic who had been started on a lower efficacy DMT. Hopefully, the evidence from this study will spur a conversation between you and your MS specialist or neurologist, and that conversation should balance your goals and your level of risk tolerance in determining the right disease-modifying therapy for you. I also want to point out that there's a large clinical trial taking place here in the United States called Treat MS. And this clinical trial is focused on exploring the same question that this population-based study explored in the Czech Republic and Sweden. If you'd like to learn more about Treat MS and possibly participate in this randomized controlled clinical trial, you'll want to visit the Treat MS website at treat-mstrial.org. And you'll find that link in today's show notes, along with a link to the published study results from the Czech Republic. Myelin repair, or remyelination, is an important goal in MS research. And because myelin repair means restoring the function that's been lost to MS, it's also a subject of keen interest among people living with MS. The commonly held hypothesis is that remyelination can be facilitated by reducing or eliminating the activation of two types of support cells in the central nervous system. These two types of cells are called microglia and astrocytes, and collectively, they're referred to as glial cells. However, research presented just last week at the European Meeting on Glial Cells in Health and Disease contradicts this popular hypothesis and provides evidence to the contrary. Biotech company Immune Bio shared data that their experimental therapy, XPRO1595, may promote remyelination by activating these glial cells. XPRO1595 is a molecule that selectively blocks a pro-inflammatory protein that's been implicated in nervous system damage in autoimmune disease. This protein has a counterpart, which has been shown to help repair the nervous system. So XPRO1595 blocks the damaging aspect of this particular protein, while its counterpart's repairing process is not targeted. And data from a Phase one study that involved Alzheimer's patients indicated that XPRO1595 may promote myelin repair. In a follow-up experiment, the research team introduced XPRO1595 to mice with myelin loss and saw that the therapy promoted remyelination. They also noted that the remyelination appeared to be driven by the activation of microglia and astrocytes, which facilitated the clearance of damaged myelin and paved the way for efficient myelin repair. The research team pointed out that when they genetically engineered the microglia in these mice so that it lacked that damaging protein, more normal motor function was also restored in the mice. The research team was able to conclude that activating astrocytes and microglia in the central nervous system is required to promote remyelination. This novel contradiction to the commonly held hypothesis surrounding the role of glial cells in the central nervous system among people experiencing neuroinflammation is going to attract attention from the MS research community. It's going to be interesting to see where it leads, and we'll be sure to keep you posted. I want to remind you that in less than two weeks, on Saturday, July 29th, 
I'll be in Napa Valley, California, attending Crush MS. Crush MS brings some amazing wineries together to raise awareness of MS and to raise funds for MS research. I'll be there with an MS research update, but you really want to be at Crush MS for the wine, the food, and the music. If you can get yourself to Napa, California on Saturday, July 29th, I can't think of a better place for you to be than at Reed Family Vineyards for Crush MS. You can get more information and buy your tickets to attend at crushms.org. And Kevin Reed, the man behind Crush MS, told me that if you're living with MS, you'll get a deep discount on that ticket price by emailing him at info at crushms.org. Kevin also told me that every Real Talk MS listener can get a 10% discount on the price of tickets by including the discount code RealTalkMSDiscount. Now that's all one word, and the R is capitalized. You can check out that discount code in today's show notes to make sure you have it right. I always love connecting with members of the Real Talk MS listener community, so if you find yourself at Crush MS on Saturday, July 29th, I hope you'll stop and say hello. You'll find the special Real Talk MS discount code and a link to get your tickets for Crush MS in today's show notes. There's some good news for those of you who find that your MS is well managed using Ocrevus, but you aren't too happy about getting to a hospital or infusion center for that infusion. Once you factor in getting to and from the infusion center itself, along with the time it takes for the actual infusion, it can take hours out of your day. So the good news is that results from a clinical trial show that a new formulation of Ocrevus administered by means of a 10-minute under-the-skin injection was comparable to the intravenous version of the therapy at reducing brain lesions visible on an MRI scan. Roche, the manufacturer of Ocrevus, will be submitting the data from this clinical trial to the FDA and EMA to support approval of this more convenient dosing regimen. While patients will still receive Ocrevus every six months, the 10-minute dosing will not only be more convenient, but because a subcutaneous injection doesn't require the facility infrastructure needed for intravenous infusions, Ocrevus treatments should become available at many more MS centers. We'll keep you posted on this news as the data from this clinical trial makes its way through the regulatory process. Some people have told me that just visiting an infusion center is stressful for them. Many people have told me that getting an MRI exam is anxiety-producing. Simply living with MS, not knowing when, if, or how it may progress, can create anxiety all by itself. Learning to effectively manage stress and anxiety is important for everyone. And if you're living with MS, it may be doubly important. Joining me to help us better understand what stress and anxiety are all about and how to keep them in check is my guest, Dr. Bree Wanamaker. I'm sure everyone has days when it feels as though stress and anxiety are baked right into our DNA. But that isn't really the case. And while stress and anxiety affect everyone some of the time, these unwelcome feelings can affect people living with MS more frequently. Joining me to talk about the impact that stress and anxiety have on your physical and mental health, along with strategies you can use to help you manage the stress and anxiety in your life, is Dr. Bree Wanamaker. Dr. Wanamaker lives with MS, and she's a licensed professional counselor and chief therapist and consultant in her practice, Just Us Counseling and Consulting, LLC, in South Carolina. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Wanamaker. Hi, John. Thank you for having me. I always like to start conversations like these by providing some definitions. So I'm hoping you can explain the difference between stress and anxiety and then explain how someone can tell them apart. Well, stress is um, defined as our, it can be defined as pretty much any changes that cause physical, emotional, or psychological strain uh, within a person. Um, It's our body's response to external 
um, factors. So anything that's going to require our attention or action in some way, shape or form can um, can can cause stress. Um, but we're going to all respond very, very differently. It's really about our perception of, about what's going on around us when it comes to anxiety. Anxiety is harder to pinpoint. Um, it it kind of can come out of nowhere and it can be a slow build of feelings and thoughts and things of that nature that can show up physically in our bodies. But it's really about, um, it's really based on a level of uncertainty. Um, It's our mind's way of kind of ping-ponging back and forth between the space of the unknown. Um, Again, something good happens, we can celebrate, something bad happens, we mourn, we cry, we do whatever is associated with the bad feelings. Anxiety is the space in between there where we're trying to find a a resolute answer of what's going to happen in this situation and we can't figure it out. And so that can kind of trigger anxiety. The difference between the two is usually stress is caused by external types of things. So being in the grocery store line and somebody and you're late to pick someone up or you think you're going to be late, this person's counting pennies, that's stressful in the moment, but it subsides after that moment is gone. When it comes to anxiety, it's harder to pinpoint what is happening or where it's coming from. What are some of the common causes of stress and anxiety? So some of the common causes for anxiety is, again, it is that level of uncertainty and kind of impending danger or loom of dread or some sort that something bad is going to happen. And it can be triggered by almost anything. The other thing with anxiety is um, it's not always related to an underlying condition. We hear that all the time, but that's not always the case. Um, It can be related to emotional trauma, um, financial concerns. It can be related to um, consumption of alcohol and self substances and a lack of oxygen sometimes can trigger anxiety as well, or at least your body can, it can start showing some of those physical symptoms um, with that. When it comes to stress, there are a lot of things that can kind of stress us out work, um, having an ineffective people leader at work, having a huge workload, being stressed out about um, meeting work deadlines being fearful of having a flare or an exacerbation with your MS and then not meeting those deadlines can cause stress, financial things, people, (laughs) uh, relationships, and um, just kind of the day-to-day life of just managing a home and or your living spaces can cause stress. I want to ask you about something that for better or worse, or maybe I should say for better and worse is in all of our lives to some degree. What about social media? What role does social media play when it comes to causing stress and anxiety, especially but but not exclusively for young people? The validation that we used to get from human contact, we now a lot of people look for it from social media. Um, you know, you used to get the paper notes. I like you. You like me. Uh, do you like me? Yes, no. Yes, box. No box. Maybe box. Right now, we stress out about this person didn't like my picture. Is this picture going to be beautiful enough? Does you know what are people going to think if I put this status out there? And we're looking for a certain level of acceptance that comes with the like buttons or the dislikes or the shares and all of those things in social media that kind of provide a certain level of validation. Because when we think about it and our pictures get a lot of likes, it makes us feel good. But when it doesn't, it's like, what did I do wrong in this picture? Oh, it's my eye. Oh, it's this. And we start pointing out those negative spaces. And so that's when we're posting. But the other thing is we can't filter out what we see on social media. And so... We can end up in a rabbit hole of we might look at maybe like one day where we're looking at negative videos. And then now that's all we're seeing, because, of course, the algorithm is now feeding you what you saw the last time or you said something out loud in your house. (laughs) And now guess what's happening? You're starting to see all of these videos. So you could talk about. Um, a negative experience that you've had with MS. And now guess what's going to be on your newsfeed? It's going to be the negative experiences with MS or all of the things dealing with MS and a lot of times your worst case scenarios. And so we can't filter out a lot of those things. And so it can then start to stress us out because we start to worry and create anxiety because we're not sure what's going to happen. And so social media is, it is a pit. It can be, it can be helpful. Don't get me wrong, but it's, it's really finding that fine balance of what you're engaging in on social media. 
What are some of the common misconceptions about stress and anxiety that people tend to have? Uh, there's a one size fits all or it looks the same for everybody. Um, anxiety is not always, you know, what we see on TV as the panic attacks where people are bald in the corner, crying, shaking, you know, all of those things or breathing into like the paper bag. Right. That's not always what it looks like. Sometimes it is gut issues. Sometimes it is not being able to sleep. Sometimes it's overeating or under eating like it can show up very differently. And the same thing with stress. Stress is not always going to show up as high blood pressure. Um, it can show up in impacting your relationships, your mood and your ability to focus and concentrate as well. Um, but also if you're if you're rainbows and unicorns all the time, then guess what? You're never going to be stressed or be anxious. That's not the case. Stress is normal. Um, and it's it's OK. We're going to have it. We're alive. We're here to experience stress. Those things are going to happen. However, it's how we perceive what's going on in our environments and how we manage those perceptions and how we manage how we deal with the stress that makes the difference. Stress and anxiety are are feelings that manifest themselves in very real ways. How do they or how could they impact someone's physical and mental health? So when we think about uh, the the physical health part, so anxiety, first off, is it puts your body in that fight or flight mode. Um, and so that means you have adrenaline pumping, you have the stress hormones pumping. And, and so what ends up happening is um, your body kind of stays in that fight or flight mode. And a long period of time, you never get back to level ground. You never, it never kind of calms down. And so what ends up happening, it starts to impact your immune system because that's not the right chemical balance that should be happening in your body. When we talk about chronic stress, again, stress in spurts is natural. But when we're talking about being stressed over a long period of time, again, it weakens your immune system. It puts you at higher risk for um, health problems, including mental health, um, including anxiety when you're dealing with chronic stress, um, depression, digestive issues, headaches, muscle tension. Again, like, you know, I'm working. And I'm like, how, why is my shoulder touching my earlobe? Right. Because I'm stressed and not realizing that my body is starting to show it. And so, um, or dealing with uh, physical pain and heart attack, it puts us at a greater risk for heart attack and stroke as well. At the beginning of our conversation, I mentioned that people who are living with MS can experience stress and anxiety more frequently. What are some of the common emotional, mental, or physical stressors that are experienced by people who are living with MS? I think the biggest the biggest stressor that I've found um, has been uncertainty about the future. You know, we know MS impacts, you know, the the covering on our brains and then the nerves in our, in our spines, right? And so, and those things control every function of our body. And so um, that uncertainty of when I wake up one morning and I'm feeling different today than I felt the other day, is it MS related or, you know, did I eat something crazy yesterday? Um, or, you know, did I not get enough sleep? And so it's that uncertainty of which is causing which, the chicken or the egg. Um, doctor's appointments, can be some of those stressors when we're preparing for an MRI and um, this headache that I've had for two days, are they going to tell me it's something different? Um, Day-to-day chores and just keeping your house in a way that is um, that you'd like to see it. Washing dishes, ironing clothes. I don't iron. I toss them in the dryer. You know, that's, that's just my way of kind of managing one of those little small stressors. But it, it, it helps, right? Um, when we talk about people, people can be stressful emotionally. We all have that one person in our life that calls us, our phone rings, and we're like, oh my goodness, do I have to? And, but we're trying to be the good friend. We're trying to be supportive. And we pick up the phone anyway, knowing that it's going to cause emotional and mental angst for us later. Um, being able to put in that boundary and say, no, I'm not going to answer today. But those are some of those common like day-to-day things that we don't really think about can cause stress but they absolutely can. And then just, again, the feelings of fatigue that can come. And, you know, when you're dealing with your MS symptoms and trying to manage all of the things in life, a lot of times we forget to kind of grant ourselves some grace to not have to manage every single thing, but those day-to-day to-do lists that we have and parenting and kids and all of those things, those things can um, be those, those kind of daily stressors that we kind of see. While we're talking about stressors that can impact people who are living with MS, can you talk about the common stressors that might be experienced by MS caregivers? 
burnout. Um, so burnout is is very real, and it comes from like we're, we're when you're a caregiver, you're constantly doing things and trying to make sure that you're doing doing it perfectly. A lot of instances that what I've heard from other caregivers is they're trying to make sure they check all of the boxes. They're trying to make sure it's the best experience for the person that they're caring for and that everything goes right all the time. That's overwhelming. That contributes to to burnout, but also when you aren't taking care of yourself um, as a caregiver and taking that time away from, from I don't want to say from caring for the other person, but taking a few minutes to um, just take a moment to breathe and to grant, again, grant yourself some grace. Those are some of the things that can become stresses for caregivers too, because they are so consumed a lot of times with caring for the other person that they forget to care for their own needs too. Um, and when you think about uh, some of the other things with caregivers, it is coordinating your life, my life, and all of the things um, that come with that. And so not being able to to feel like they can depend on someone else because this is my spouse. I should be the person doing everything for them. That's why there's a network of, you know, MS experts. That's why there's a network of caregivers. That's why there's respite um, to take a moment and take a few hours to go and get a haircut, to go walk through the grocery store or to do something that you enjoy while someone else builds or, you know, takes care of that loved one. But some of the stressors is when you feel like you have to do everything alone and not asking for help. Can you share some coping mechanisms or lifestyle modifications that someone can use to help manage their stress and anxiety. Um, and so this goes for the person living with MS as well as the caregiver. So to-do list, right? Um, or just journaling. So getting stuff out of your head onto paper is is really helpful. And it's a, it's a small thing that you will find can be extremely helpful for you. Um, asking for help is a way that you're able to kind of manage those day-to-day things and manage what's happening in your life. Doing things in small increments, small increments for long-term gain, folding one load of laundry um, and not folding all of the loads of laundry. Take Again, taking time for just kind of self-care for you. What does that really and truly look like for you? TV, (laughs) Um, controlling what you can control, right? You don't have to watch all of the news. You don't have to watch the first eight minutes of the news when they're talking about all the catastrophes in the world. Can you watch the last 22 minutes when they're talking about the cute cat that, you know, had several kittens? Can you control what you are taking in versus um, not being able to manage what you're ingesting, because those those are things that we can control. We can't control traffic, but I can control whether or not I leave my house a few minutes early. Um, Identifying what some of your stresses are in your life. And then again, how do you manage those stressors, but also how can you eliminate some of those things? Because we don't always have to pick up the phone. We don't always have to fold every single piece of clothing in the house. But some of those things can be extremely stressful, especially if that's how you grew up. And so it's really tra- finding those small little things. But the biggest thing is asking for help. That is the biggest way that we can absolutely begin to manage and do those small life. That's the smallest change that we could make in our life for the biggest impact. There are people in the world who either ignore their mental health issues or they acknowledge them, but just try to barrel through them without making any changes or seeking any help. What are some of the potential long-term consequences of ignoring mental health concerns? So the same way our physical health, if we ignore something physically, that it can become even more exacerbated. It gets worse if we ignore it. That's the same thing that happens with mental illness. Um, if we ignore it, it can get worse. So you're you're talking about um, impacting your relationships um, in a in a in a negative way, where you can start to lose relationships, lose support people in your circle, um, impacting your job and your ability to function at work. Depending on the mental health symptoms that you're dealing with, not even showing up for work or starting to use substances and alcohol to make yourself feel better um, when we put those things off. Those can be some of the consequences, but also, again, our mental health impacts our physical health. 
Um, sometimes it impacts our ability to take care of ourselves and the choices and the foods and things that we eat, but also depending on the type of symptom that you're experiencing, being at those high levels of stress and having those stress hormones all the time can again start to contribute to some of those things we talked about earlier, dealing with um, increased risk for heart disease and your your appetite, you know, having eating too much, not eating enough, not sleeping. Um, but, you know, it can t- contribute to some of those things. I think that when someone recognizes mental health issues, the first Mm -hmm. step is they're going to try to manage those issues themselves. How does someone know when it's time to see a professional? So I I teach master's level students and I joke with my students all the time. You can't you can't therapeutize yourself It's not a word, but they get it when I say it right. When you realize that it's starting to, the thing that we we look at as men, mental health professionals is how much is this impacting your day-to-day life and the, your ability to function, um, your ability to take care of your daily needs, to work, um, to take care of your physical body, right? As far as like showering and just the, the bare minimum. Um, so we look at how much is this impacting your ability to do that? That That is one of the indicators. Again, knowing your body and knowing that uh, what those changes look like. So when you start seeing some of the physical signs of it, it you definitely want to seek some help. Uh, when people around you start to tell you, like they're, you're different, you're snippy, you're, you're rude, um, uh, you just don't kind of look like you used to look all the time and not, a, but these are your safe people, not like people who don't know you. But, um, when you start to hear some of those things, um, that's typically an indicator that you need to seek some extra help. But here's the other thing. If you think you need help, that's also your indicator. If you start to think, well, maybe I should talk to somebody, guess what? Then absolutely you should. Are there mental health support resources that you might recommend for people living with MS? Just so some general resources, um, you have like Mental Health America that has a lot of different articles on there, like some dealing with relationships and how do you talk to people about your mental health. Um, and they have various topics on so Mental Health America website, but also NAMI. Um, when we talk about people living specifically with MS, a lot of your local chapters will have local support MS groups that, um, you know, that have some of the trained facilitators that where you can go in and talk to people who are having similar experiences, but also get encouragement from others who you are, who you see are building that resilience, who you see are navigating different spaces. The thing you want to do is like when you when you go into some of these self-help groups and these support groups, if you notice that you're feeling worse after two meetings um, than you did when you go in, you might want to find another group um, because it depends on the, the dynamics and the atmosphere there. But also looking into your insurance company um, for and looking at your provider websites to see whether or not they have specialty backgrounds in dealing with people with chronic illnesses, um, because there are some some therapists who specialize in dealing with individuals with chronic illnesses as well. Dr. Bree Wanamaker, thank you for all you do to improve the quality of life for people affected by MS. And thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you, John, for having me. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 307. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. And if you have a minute, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free RealTalk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the best way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of RealTalk MS. You'll be able to access any of our past episodes. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. The app is free, so I hope you'll download it today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.